This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Marosha Shai. Review two, ones and zeros and peg. So this is episode two of Mr. Robot. And once again, we are going to cover what is real and what is not real with some of the hacker uh, usages within the episode. We're also going to discuss who Mr. Robot is. Um, because right now there's kind of two ongoing theories that I have. I'm going to discuss one of those theories on the show, and then I'm going to save the other theory for episode three. I think I need a little bit more shown about Mr. Robot before I disclose the type of personality that Mr. Robot is uh, based off of, that the, the actual hacker influences or the computer people or tech people that have existed in the real world that... Mr. Robot might be in kind of a bit of an agglomation of. But before we go anything else, let's let's get into the episode. So the episode picks up exactly where it, it ended the last episode with Elliot in the room full of uh, men in suits with uh, Tyler Wilkinson, the uh, computer savvy vice president of Evil Corp, uh, sitting in the room with him, greeting him. It eventually is disclosed that uh, Tyler wants to hire Elliot to be the head of Evil Corp's cybersecurity, which is a sweet position if Elliot being part of F Society, if he chooses to continue to be part of F Society, would allow him to be basically in the belly of the beast. What's interesting about this whole entire conversation is because uh, Tyler is sitting there with, uh, as he calls it, 11 of the, the most annoying lawyers that Evil Corp has because they're not allowed to openly and actively recruit Elliot because of the non-compete disclosure agreement that they have with Allsafe. Um, and so basically what it comes down to is the whole men in suits that have been following Elliot that we've been He's discussed and talked about in both episode, uh, the pilot episode. It was basically was Evil Corp sort of shadowing Elliot and figuring out whether or not he is a, somebody they want to recruit for this position. And Tyler is very keen to get Elliot. He understands Elliot. He knows what Elliot is. He understands that Elliot is a very good hacker. And that's why he's offering him this position. Uh, when it's, what's most interesting is this, is that this is not an uncommon tactic for corporations in general, not just for the cybersecurity, but in general in their recruitment methods, where they actually do like a hire private investigators. They actually hire people to shadow their potential recruits, find all sorts of type of information about them, and then evaluate whether or not they want to bring them within the company. It's also not uncommon that uh, corporations somehow try to finagle their way out of non uh, compete agreements. Uh, one of the biggest things that happened was uh, not too long ago was just close last year that Google, like Pixar, Microsoft, Apple, and a number of other corporations got in some big uh, to, to do with the federal government and rightfully so because basically what they did was that they were secretly keeping wages down. They basically had this internalized agreement stating that they were not going to re- actively recruit their other the, each other's employees. So, for example, Facebook would recruit a Google person, a Google person would recruit Facebook, uh, vice versa with the Apple stuff. And they, also, they were basically saying that we're, we shouldn't be paying these people this amount of wages, and so they keep the wages down. And as a, because of this, uh, when this came out, this was disclosed. There's a bunch of lawsuits. They had to pay these fines to both the state and the federal government. It's still, some of it's still ongoing. <laughs> But it's just an example of the type of collusion that could happen at the corporate level to keep competition down, keep wages down, but also to keep talent pools or certain types of talent within their space. Like there's agreement and agreement not to, you know, recruit one another. Uh, obviously, this is not the case with all safe where Evil Corp is basically just outright kind of sort of in a sly way violating this agreement by trying to recruit Elliot to be the head of their new cybersecurity. Uh, Tyler once again will continue forward uh, because Elliot wants to think about it, which again is very interesting that, and it shows a kind of um, the different dichotomy between Tyler and Elliot. Elliot is very introverted. He doesn't like to be associate with other people. And so he, his understanding of social normities has to do with his anxiety of being around people. While it seems that Tyler Wilkinson's, even though he is outwardly displaying to being 
um, you might say an outgoing person, a well together, well adjusted person. It seems underneath the surface, it's very apparent and very clear that he too also doesn't have an understanding of the social niceties and, and social interactions with humans or with other people. It has not to do with the fact that he, he doesn't want to be around people. It's just he might not have what some people consider uh, empathy or understanding. He might actually be like a sociopath. He comes across clearly this actor who's portraying him or the the way they characterize him as particular executive is kind of a a Patrick Patrick Bateman type of a character. Have you ever seen the American Psycho with a Christian Bale? And so when he's sitting there, sitting across from Elliot in this big room with a bunch of people and asking him and offering him this job, he fails to understand that that may not have been the best way to to ask Elliot uh, because Elliot has a very strong social uh, anxiety disorder and he might not want to have been forthright in asking. And when Tyler vacated the lawyers and, and pushed the issue, uh, Elliot got very def- defensive and actually, in, in essence, rejected the offer. And this causes Tyler, it seemed for like a split second, like Tyler wanted actually to, to hit Elliot, uh, but that didn't happen. Tyler just sees it, I guess, as another challenge that he's going to somehow convince Elliot to come over to Evil Corp, uh, be the head of their cybersecurity and, and solve their issues and problems when it comes with to do with these hackers. Um, he also, uh, Taylor also disclosed to Elliot something that already Elliot and even his boss uh, know is that Allsafe is almost pretty much done since uh, Allsafe is basically Evil Corp is Allsafe's number one and only pretty much only client. And as soon as they leave there, there is no Allsafe. The, the business in of itself is going to collapse. So Elliot is driven back to his place by the basically the same men in black suits that uh, picked him up. And they tell this weird kind of JFK uh, this joke uh, where one of them says, you know, you can call me Mr. X. And then he looks at uh, Elliot to see kind of a reaction. And he goes, oh, no, you can just call me uh, Mr. Sutherland. And again, Elliot doesn't give any kind of reaction to the joke that's being told there. And he basically tells him, you need to go see Oliver Stone's JFK. Uh, what's funny about this is the code names that the the goons were given, Mr. X and, and, and Mr. Sutherland, has to do with the fact that they're one and the same. And they're both the same person. Mr. X is played by uh, Donald Sutherland from the, the uh, JFK movie. But what was probably, probably the primary reason why Elliot wasn't really paying attention to these guys is the fact that as he's looking out um, to his apartment, he sees that uh, the woman he typically gets his drugs from, Shayla, uh, is having some kind of discussion or interlude with uh, the, her primary drug dealer, the person who supplies her the drugs to sell to Elliot. And they're having some sort of exchange. So Elliot is fixated on it because Elliot has a, a savior complex. He believes, as he stated, that he can save the world and particularly he can save the people around him. That's why he does all these social hacking. And so with particularly he has a, a strong need to save the, the women in his life, whether it be his uh, best friend, Angela, or his therapist. And now Shayla, his uh, drug dealer, which I think is going to be is going to eventually bring some huge problems for Elliot on a personal level, because you can't continue to hack or attempt to save people with the type of person that Elliot is and the, the manner in which he does it without some significant consequences. I'm sure they're building up to that. So Elliot exits the vehicle that with the basically I want to call them the goon squad and goes over toward, towards his drug dealer. Uh, the goon squad leaves a message stating that they're around at any point in time that Elliot wants to contact them and they leave their information with Elliot, which again implies that Evil Corp really has a, a strong desire or design for uh, the recruitment of Elliot into their organization. Uh, I don't know if there's some underlining issue that we haven't been presented yet why specifically they're seeking out Elliot but it's obvious that they're investing some time and effort into him so he has a conversation with Shayla and basically what it is is that he's up in his morphine intake uh, a morphine intake that he believes he has control of because he only does a certain amount and then he has the withdrawal pills that he takes uh, to prevent him from being a full-blown addict um 
he convinces her to give him just the morphine, even though she doesn't have what is called a Stuxin, which is the uh, withdrawal medication for people that have morphine. So he can um, manage his, I guess you can say the shakes or whatever that he has when uh, using morphine. Uh, she does uh, give it to him and he then proceeds to uh, consume a far much larger amount than he normally does. So clearly right now, um, is it, it's an indication here in the show that uh, Elliot is going through um, a significant anxiety, a significant stress level. He's under a far greater stress than he probably has him. As far as we know, uh, that's been previously shown to us um, in experience. So Elliot proceeds to uh, get his fix, take it a larger amount than um, he normally does. And he begins to talk to his friend again. And basically, they, he, he tells his friend that they're going to work. And so they get on the computer and they're about to, uh, they're basically hacking into Tyler Wel- Wel- Welker, the uh, vice president of Evil Corp that offered him the job. And he talks about two things. He talks about shell shock, which is actually an, uh, a real world existing uh, malware issue. Uh, shell shock does, as it is stated, uh, affect the server's of computers uh, allows for vulnerabilities to occur where people are able to basically easy access uh, different types of servers. It was a big heart, a big problem. Think of it in the equivalent of heart bleed, which occurred, I think it was early last year, which was a, a password issue where basically everyone's passwords were just vulnerable and easy for people to access. So all everybody had to like change their passwords, every type of app program, uh, computer Association. It was a, a built-in flaw within the the within uh, certain types of programs that existed out there that everyone just basically had to change their passwords or otherwise you're you're open to this certain vulnerability and there was all these different patches that were going along and shell shock is was another one of these type of cases but it was dealing with servers. The other thing you mentioned was um, two FA, which is two. Um, two-part uh optimization is basically like if you were to use for example twitter does this if you were to um log on to your twitter account and add your phone number what would happen is each time you log on twitter will send you an sms message sms message and it'll have a code and then you type the code in into your twitter account and then that would activate your code um Bank accounts do this. Bitcoin is known for doing this. It's a security measure, measure uh, 2FA to prevent uh, hacking because basically if they, someone were able to hack or keystroke your uh, key log your password or figure it out like Elliot does with social ha- social engineering, social hacking, if you they don't have your cell phone um, number or don't have your uh, clone your cell phone and get that uh, code, they're not going to be able to get into your information. And so basically what Elliot is saying is that not only was his uh, social password when he's doing this hack uh, easy to figure out, it was like his wife's maiden name and when Sweden became independent, but it, he didn't have 2FA and he's a bit concerned by this and becomes very paranoid because he thinks Tyler, you know, someone who uses Linux and has an understanding of computers and just uh, overall in general, Elliot gets a sense that he's much smarter than he's portraying himself to be, that this act was too easy, that maybe Tyler wanted him to hack and wanted him to see what's going on. So Elliot begins to, to panic. Because he, he doesn't understand whether or not, you know, Tyler Wilkinson wanted him to hack him. Was it too easy to hack him? Uh, should he have done this? And so what he does is he he starts taking his hard drive apart and he starts wiping everything down, as he says. And, be, and one of the things he does is he actually takes a drill bit and starts drilling into the various hard drives. And this is something that security experts do. This is something that actually the military does all the time. Whenever they update their servers or whenever they update computers and they pull hard drives off, out, install new ones, is they take the old hard drive and they actually drill holes into it so that it can never, none of the data can actually be recovered. Uh, they also use other things like wiping um, within the hard drive first to wipe all the information out and then phys- doing the physical damage the punch hole as it's called and punch and hold into various hard drives so not only does Elliot do this but he does this other thing where he actually pulls out the SD cards and the, the micro cards uh, the various computers have and uh, the data information starts yanking them out of the various ports he has and throws them in the microwave and nukes it 
And I just, uh, when I saw this, I was like, no, that's this, this, this Hollywood is, is, that's not real. And so I started looking and find, trying to find the answer. And it took a couple of days and I was able to find a, uh, a post that talked about this, the reality of this, that this is something that actually that can be done. And it is true because I personally thought that, that it was a very Hollywood thing. This is would be like the really first like serious uh, Hollywood thing that was on the show when it comes to to hacking and like kind of exaggerated type of thing that you often see in Holly and Hollywood and they depict depict on uh, computers. But it turns out that that's not the case. That uh, this is a type of burn method that even the military does, but they have a special box for it where they. Um, put the, the micro uh, tags or the information in and in essence they basically nuke the information so it can never be recovered so I personally find that very fascinating and that is a uh, I guess you could say um, not a low key but a, maybe a poor man's version of that box is using the microwave so I found that very fascinating and that's something you could can do and do so after doing this, you know, uh, Elliot's basically, you know, destroyed his op- operation center there. Uh, we have a, basically a brief moment of him consuming more drugs, uh, still uh, frying uh, chips uh, in the microwave. Uh, he has a moment where he looks at a picture is obviously a younger version of him and his mother, whom he has not spoken about. But we did see a brief flashback in the pilot episode. So. He goes and he deals with the dog. He throws away his uh, computer components and he heads basically the next scene we see is him coming to work and everyone very concerned about um, with the Terry Colby being caught, um, what that means for all safe and the company. And he sits down with his boss and his boss is basically saying to him, saying to him that um, he's going to get a salary raise. Um, and he wanted to know why Elliot never told him about what was in the DAT file. And basically, Elliot kind of like lies to him, like he just didn't know what was in there. His boss didn't quite believe it, but Elliot then kind of does this, this little slight hinter of defiant to, to him that we've been seeing a little bit uh, from Elliot uh, that, you know, his boss doesn't really know him. Um, his boss then turns around and says, you know, OK, well, uh, we need to you stay on the case because uh, we don't know what these F society hackers are going to do next. And Elliot was surprised that his boss knew that it was F Society. Um, he didn't think anybody knew that F Society was responsible, even though that was the name of the, the DAT file. And his boss breaks down and explains that, hey, uh, no, uh, there is this video that was released and they, they're threatening to release a bunch of, ter- uh, of information about uh, Evil Corp if the FBI does not release uh, Terry Colby. And so Elliot watches the video and it's very reminiscent of the Anon videos, anonymous videos when uh, anonymous first came out, when they were talking about all the various hacks they were doing uh, because of the NSA, particularly off against uh, the intelligence agencies, or I should say not the intelligence agencies, but the the apparatchet stuff that the intelligence agencies use, the different companies they use to do to, to do basically all the, the intelligence gathering for them. Uh, the imagery is very similar. Uh, the actual like saying that we're going to release this information if the corporation doesn't do X, Y and Z is also reminiscent of the real world incident with Sony where GOP, which stands for uh, Guardians of Peace, which uh, some people are unsure of the narrative or whether or not they're actually from North North Korea or not. Uh, they could be uh, from North Korea using Chinese hackers, or they can be a totally different hacker group that is using the North Korea as uh, as a cover. Uh, but pretty much the narrative has been that North Korea was responsible for the Sony hack because of the uh, movie that was coming out, the, the Kim Il Jong movie that was coming out. Uh, they didn't want that to be released. And so they were going to lose all this information, which they did. They did all these different dumps uh, you could which is now searchable on WikiLeaks and it's um it was very damaging to the image of Sony particularly when it came to not only the the image of Sony uh, some of the the various emails that were coming out from it but there's also some potential criminal liability issues when it comes to Sony because there's issue of possible bribery that they were doing 
uh, the certain types of the way they pay scale and pay people. I'm sure as time goes on, even though it's been that occurred, I guess, back in December, um, and WikiLeaks has now just released a little bit last month and some this month with the searchable results for the Sony hacks. Uh, it would be interesting to see how that pans out. But again, that is the real world influence on the show is and on the group. And the G- I would say that the, the GOP threat against a corporation as obviously is what the basis of the influence for the, the behavior of F society on the show. So Elliot watches the video and you can totally tell it's Mr. Robot that's in the video. And the reason why you can tell is that the distortion on the voice is through the perception of Elliot. Uh, the entire show is through the perception of Elliot. And you can totally hear Christian Slater's voice through the distortion. And the mannerism is very clear that you want to, the, the show wants you to know through Elliot that, that it's Christian Slater, Mr. Robot, that's behind this, this animal mask, uh, giving out F Society's uh, demands. So Elliot watches the video and, and he, it, this brings him to question everything about F Society. He thought they were here to wipe out the corporation's servers so everyone's credit can basically go down to zero like Fight Club. And now they're taunting the FBI and threatening to doing a data dump if you know Terry Colby is not released, which is not what he signed up for and is not what he thought this, and it's not what he thought F Society was all about. So Elliot leaves the office and he, he's going back home. Uh, he gets uh, stopped by Angela and her boyfriend and they're going to invite him to dinner later on, which he is he's not going to go to. Uh, but the whole point of this scene is that there is a street hustler out there outside their building that's handing out CDs uh, to try to get people to listen to his, you know, mixtape and go and download his latest hot track. And he starts talking to uh, Ollie's, uh, which is the name of Angela's uh, boyfriend, and starts talking to him and starts, uh, you know, putting on the juice, I guess you can say, to try to get him to listen to the uh, to the CD. And, you know, Ollie finally says, yeah, you know, but, you know, you need to, you know, you need to stop being in front of our ability. You've been here for two weeks. You know, come on, man. You know, I'll listen to this. I, you know, I don't have any followers, but, you know, they start talking to kind of social media aspect, but the guy's like, no, 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 you know, listen to track two. Your girl's going to like it. He tries to put some big old cell, hands in the CD. Uh, I think he is, they exchange maybe money, like five, five or 10 bucks for the thing. And, uh, that's pretty much the end of the scene. And the key here is that this is, uh, which is later revealed that the, the CD is a Trojan horse to get onto uh, Ollie's computer. And that this guy has been out there on a mission, really. And the mission is not to sell his, you know, latest uh, hot track of a mix mix rap beats, bedroom rap, rap beats, but to have access to anyone in all safe. Uh, he's been out in this building approaching as many people as he could to get them to take this CD to gain access to all safe. Uh, that was, that is pretty much his mission. He's a hacker and he's, we're going to learn a little bit later in the episode of this hacker, the hacker group he's a part of, but this is something that uh, hackers do. And it's also something the government does. I mean, the government's been known to intercept uh, people's laptops, install malware or Trojan horse so they can monitor these people's um, uh, income in and out going traffic. Uh, uh, There's been cases where people have, you know, either you, you hear a lot about emails, but just downloading a picture uh, downloading a MP3 file, uh, thinking that they're updating their uh, Adobe software or some other program and being hit with a, a Trojan horse or malware. Uh, when it comes to government or even the cases of hackers, they've been known to use um, certain aspects of hardware and install it in people's computers without them even being aware of it. Uh, office companies have been hit where if they leave their... Uh, computers unattended uh, a hacker or, or will go and they will hit uh install a usb drive a thumb drive into the 
to the computer and begin to uh, upload whatever uh, particular malware that they need to upload and then walk away. And now they have access to that particular office's uh, information. And there's a number of different ways that hackers do this. You know, you have the credit card thing with the slide thing where it's not actually what they do is they put a, a little device into the slider of, you know, gas pumps, ATM machines. This is why you no longer see a lot of ATM machines that have the slider on the outside. Everything's the inside. You have to push in in order to uh, swipe your card uh, because they were able to put this little device. What they were able to do is uh, super strangely take all the people's credit information. So you swipe the card. You think either something's wrong with your card or something's wrong with the machine. You go to a different machine, realize it's a machine and that machine, you know, keeps getting as many people swiping that machine to get their credit card information. And the next thing you know, by the end of the day, you have like five hundred, six hundred thousand dollar charges on your account. Uh, so this is just another aspect of social engineering that uh, hackers do. They try to come in an innocuous way, an everyday thing to gain access to your computer system. And a very old school method, too, if you think about it, the CD. How many computers now even have CDs, uh, a CD-ROM attached to it? Uh, a lot of the new and latest like notebooks and laptops don't even have that anymore. People are now going to the cloud or they're using uh, USB ports for their information. Or to and they're swiping in and out their information through their their mobile devices, either through the cloud or directly, like with a an iPhone with a USB connect. So this is this is interesting. This is something that does happen. This is something that does occur in the real world. So Elliot makes it home and he finds that there's somebody in his house and it's the uh, female hacker from the F Society group. Uh, he's shocked that she's there uh she's not and she seems to have a bit of a, a familiarity with elliot that elliot doesn't understand uh they end up uh first off elliot ends up dropping off his dog to his uh drug dealer uh girl uh and the dog's name is flipper uh she agrees to watch the dog and which will come and play later on the episode uh but what's interesting about this is the the interaction between elliot and this the, the female hacker uh from F Society, uh, I'm just going to call her headphones for now because I don't, I'm not even sure the name that is given is really her name. That it plays into the the concept of how much of reality is within Elliot's head and, and what reality is not in at play. How much of this is uh, Elliot, you know, manifesting certain hallucinations or certain uh, ideas and projecting them out in the world. Uh, we believe the, the female hacker does, you know, exist in the real world, but the, the manner upon which she's interacting with Elliot indicates that they've known each other for a while and she's very familiar with Elliot and she expects Elliot to be very familiar with her personal situation. Another interesting note is that uh, they stop at the subway station, they get there on the subway, uh, they're going to the, an F Society meeting. Uh, they get off and then they quickly get on. She actually pushes Elliot back on the subway. He looks out expecting to see, you know, was there any kind of trouble? He sees uh, the men in black that has been, have been following him, which I guess is a different set of men in black because it seems that there might be two sets. There might be the ones that actually do exist, which work for E Corp and another set that we have no idea who, who they work for, or whether or not they're actually uh, exist at all because they had the same images consistently throughout, but they were not in the car that brought uh, Elliot to uh, Tyler for the E Corp uh, recruitment meeting. So they're going to the subway, uh, they're on the subway and they're going to the F Society meeting. And Elliot has made up his mind that he's going to, as he quote, disconnect from F Society because he didn't sign up for the whole free Colby from the FBI data dump stuff. Uh, he thought that they were there to wipe out. Uh, credit information, debt information, and make everything go to zero. So Elliot gets to the F Society meeting, and we'll talk a little bit about the nature of this particular meeting. But Mr. Robot basically lays out the next phase of the plan, which is to blow up a, a natural gas plant called Comet, which is right next to a place called Steel Mountain. And Steel Mountain is where 
uh, Evil Corp and a number of different corporations have their their backup drives, their backup servers on tape. Now, this is actually a real world place. Uh, it's not called Steel Mountain. It's actually located in uh, Pennsylvania and it's called uh, Iron Mountain. And, and this location is a number, again, a number of different corporations just like in the, the TV show, keep their backup information there. Uh, and again, it's located in the East Coast where pretty much 70% of all internet traffic uh, flows on the East Coast, on the Eastern Seaboard, and particularly within the Virginia, Maryland, uh, West Virginia, P- Pennsylvania area. area. Uh, a little bit in Delaware as well, but that is, that is, this is pretty much the consistent uh, corridor for all internet traffic, which also happens to be the location of the, you know, the NSA, Pentagon, and all the alphabet soup, uh, USA, uh, even some of our, our allies' uh, intelligence agencies at the same time. So Elliot is against this because he doesn't believe that by uh, blowing up the natural gas plant, uh, while he understands it will take down, you know, Steel Mountain, a lot of people are going to die. People that surround in town, people within the mountain, people within the plant. And he doesn't want to kill anyone. He's not in for that. Uh, Mr. Robot, of course, has, has, has other ideas. He he doesn't think that this is going to be an issue. He doesn't think they're going to be caught. Uh, he thinks that with all the data dumps that they're doing, it's going to throw people off their trace and they're going to focus mostly on Kobe and less on F Society and more on the uh, the fallout from all the data dumps, which is very similar to what occurred with Sony and a number of other different corporations when it came to uh, WikiLeaks, I guess you can say, with the U.S. government. But again, Elliot is not for this. He doesn't want to kill anyone. He's very much against this. And he may, in fact, just turn everybody in. And he says that so to Mr. Robot. Now, in the course of disclosing his plan and the breakdown of the three-part plan, which is taking Steel Down Mountain, which takes out the back backup drives, um, headphone girls, um, malware, which has been installed in the servers uh, because Elliot did delete the program. And then they're going to have... Dark Army uh, take out the China backup servers. Now, Dark Army is this hacker group that hacks for anyone. It's, they have no code, as Elliot says. They work for terrorists. They work for anybody. And Dark Army is kind of based off loosely, I think, in, in essence, a number of series of hacker groups that uh, operate out of Eastern Europe. So the ethos of these particular Eastern European groups, uh, primarily Russian, but mostly out of years to be Ukraine in that particular area, is that if you pay them, they will do it. Uh, a number of the various malware that's been going through the internet, particularly the ma- ransom malware, uh, has come out of this group. Uh, they sell their their viruses to the highest bidder. They will work for anyone for the highest bidder. They, they particularly don't care. They go after corporations, small businesses, governments. And so this is probably the kind of the, the loose basis for this uh, dark army, which will come to play later on in the episode. But another group that could be uh, the basis for this, in a sense, is there's a company called the Hacking Team, which uh, market itself as, as a software agency that will basically hack in anything and everything and to develop certain software programs to infiltrate different systems. Uh, they they sold their information to you know the U.S. government. Uh, they themselves recently, in an ironic fashion, have been hacked, and they the, the leaks have shown that they not only take this malware program that allows um, for them to spy on pretty much anyone's type of computer and break all sorts of different kinds of types of uh, encryption and information, but they have also sold it to other kind of nefarious types of governments from Syria to Iran uh, to different types of agencies that have been known to not be the best when it comes to human rights. And other targets are not, you know, other states, but actually uh, individuals who speak out against that state. So <clears throat> there is some real world basis for their existence and their skill set, like uh, Elliot said, is that they, they basically go to the highest bidder, that they're, they have no allegiance. But Mr. Robot wants to use them for that sole purpose because they have no allegiance. And then the Mr. Robot uh, goes into a ones and zero uh, speech, which we'll talk about at the end of the episode, because it kind of speaks to the whole unreliable narrative of Elliot in it itself. But Elliot walks away. He wants no part of this particular uh, cause, this revolution that Mr. Robot is trying to do, because he is has no interest in killing anyone. 
So Elliot goes to pick up his dog Flipper from Shayla's uh, when he enters the apartment because obviously they have a great familiarity with one another that he can just basically come on in. Uh, he meets the uh, scumbag pusher drug dealer that supplies her and they have a confrontation where basically uh, the drug dealer makes it very apparent to Elliot that Shayla is his girl, his possession, and that he he basically owns Shayla and that whatever arrangements they had previous are no consequence and that uh, Elliot should respect and also fear him, which Elliot doesn't. Elliot doesn't fear him. Maybe he should because this guy seems kind of unstable. He does have a handgun and is pointing at Elliot for most of the most of the time that they're talking. Not to mention the fact he's way bigger than Elliot. So if there's a physical confrontation. Um, Elliot most likely would probably lose. Uh, but uh, Shayla is like in the in the bathroom, um, Elliot has tried a couple different times to get get into there, but he's having this conversation with the drug dealer. The drug dealer leaves and takes the Sumnex, which is the um, drug that Elliot needs to kind of keep his uh, morphine addiction in check. It's this kind of a, I guess, a passive aggressive manner or a really aggressive outright manner for this drug dealer to kind of control Elliot, to put him in his place by basically taking the drug that he needs to control his habit uh, because he is pretty much the only supplier in the city that has this particular pill set. So Elliot was able to get to Shayla, who was in the bathroom. She's passed out. She has no recollection recollection of uh engaging with this scumbag drug dealer is pretty much implied that he either drugged her or raped her or something went on. Shayla doesn't want to do anything. And then guess, guess what it comes down to is basically, you know, Shayla makes a lot of money through this guy. And Elliot sees, you know, the problem, which is the invisible hand that controls everything and allows people because of money they're willing to do or accept horrific and horrible situations in their life. And this kind of angers Elliot. Uh, so he decides once again to do something about it, which is part of his whole uh, saver complex that Elliot has. He's going to hack into this drug dealer's information, uh, find out all about him and basically did what he did before with the pedophile and uh, ride him out to law enforcement. So Elliot, you know, rats out the drug dealer, uh, witnesses a drug dealer getting busted Uh he goes to his uh, therapist and has a very uh, kind of despondent conversation about control. And this plays back into the earlier discussion that Mr. Robot had with Elliot about ones and zeros. And Mr. Robot basically gave this speech to Elliot stating that you're either a one or a zero. You're either a yes or a no. You either do something or you don't do something. And this is his way of trying to convince and push Elliot into uh, doing something, taking action in life and not being nothing, being a zero. In particular, what Mr. Robot does is he throws in the fact that Elliot's father, which we learned had cancer and didn't do anything about his treatment, uh, which we learned from the therapist session. Uh, basically, Elliot's father worked for a corporation, uh, which we knew about. He got sick. He was fired. Uh, he didn't fight the cancer. He didn't fight the corporation like sue him or tell them that, you know, this is how he got uh, the cancer was from working with, for this company. It turns out that company is Evil Corp. But basically, uh, he accepted his illness and just let it happen. And Elliot, at a very young age, which we learned later on, uh, tried to convince his father to say something, to do something about it. But his father did nothing. And Elliot is rocking with this. He he was what he thought he was. He thought he was part of with the F Society. He was doing this project, as he tells his therapist, that he was actually doing something good, an accomplishment. But he he doesn't think that's the case anymore. He, he feels very despondent, very discouraged. He feels that he's doing nothing, that there's no choices in life, that everything is pre-decided for you. And the example he gives is, you know, people don't get to even really choose their health insurance. You know, they have the choice between Blue Cross and Blue Shield, but choice is there for somebody. What kind of choice is that? 
So Elliot's got, you know, a psychiatrist listening to him, kind of confronts him and says that she knows he's back to his old habits. Elliot, after all, is going through withdrawal because he knows his supplier is up and he's resolved himself to no longer be a junkie. So therefore, he's very irritable. He's very despondent, very emotional, which is probably why he's having this bit of a breakthrough with the therapist. But he, again, he's still not telling her everything. Uh, they cut away to Angela and her boyfriend, uh, you know, Angela's boyfriend is trying to play the CD, which turns out to be a Trojan horse that has complete access to his computer now. Uh, they cut away to the hacker who is in a public library, which is something that uh, hackers do. They go around the uh, the city or space, uh, wherever they live, and utilize the free Y space to keep themselves mobile so they're not tied into one particular IP address or location. So it's hard for, for anyone to track their movements or find where they're at. It's clear that this hacker is in the New York Public Library. Uh, he has access to Ollie's computer and it, from the Chinese writing of the RC chat um, this might be a, a dark army person uh, we're not we're not for sure or positive on that but considering that they, they've already disclosed that dark army is a Chinese hacking group and uh, that they work and do for anything that, that this might be the case uh, then we go into Elliot kind of having a conversation with Mr. Robot. Um, Mr. Robot makes Elliot, you know, confront the fact that he is um, the reason why he's not joining the organization is because of his father, how his father died, how his father, you know, uh, actually pushed Elliot out of a, a window when Elliot told his mother about his dead father's cancer. He ended up breaking his arm. His father never spoke to Elliot again. Um, after that happened and died, you know, shortly after. And it still haunts Elliot, this fact. Uh, Mr. Robot, on the hand, on the hand uh, takes it that the reason why his father uh, pushed Elliot out of the window was because uh, they had an agreement. And the agreement was that Elliot wasn't supposed to tell anyone that he had cancer. He wasn't supposed to tell his mother. He wasn't supposed to let anybody know that he was sick. He was supposed to keep his secret. And he broke the agreement. He should have kept the agreement. And that's when Elliot, um, not Elliot, but Mr. Robot throws Elliot off a of pier. They ride a pier and he just pushes him off the pier. And that's the end of the episode. So a couple of side notes here. Um, it's been apparent from the very first episode, the pilot episode, that there's a possibility that uh, Mr. Robot might be an actual complete figment of Mr. of Elliot's uh, imagination, which would, you know, fit within the trope of that, the whole taking down corporations and wiping out people's debt. But, um, and there's little indications here and there that that might be the case. I personally am unsure of that, if that is the case. I do think that Mr. Robot does exist. Um, but then again, it would be very interesting if... Well, not quite interesting. It, uh, because it is a common trope of having, you know, your protagonist have a figment imaginary person doing all the real actions while the protagonist himself are unaware. Um, the only twist that, that would make it interesting is if Mr. Robot is actually a projected image of Elliot's father. If, uh, Mr. Robot actually looks like Elliot's father. We have not seen a picture of as of yet, or even a kind of description of what he looks like. That would be interesting. That would be, that'd be an interesting dynamic. Even if uh, Mr. Robot's personality has nothing to do whatsoever with um, Elliot's actual father's personality, that would be an interesting twist. I personally think it would be great if Mr. Robot actually does um, exist in and of itself. I think it adds a certain element of uh, dynamic and a certain type of feel and real world basis for uh, the show. Uh, even though there are people out there that do have, you know, split personalities and do exist and, and are actually highly functional in society or somewhat functional in the case of Elliot. Um, I'm not personally sure of that about it at all. Um, I'm kind of either way. We'll see how it goes. I think we'll, we'll learn, we'll learn pretty quickly which uh, end of the spectrum is going to be if he, Mr. Robot actually is a figment of Elliot's imagination or if he a actually does exist. The other figments of Elliot's imagination is whether or not the, the additional men in black that uh, we keep seeing within the show 
whether it be uh, when he was outside of uh, his therapist's office, uh, not outside his therapist's office, but outside uh, his therapist's fake boyfriend's office, whether or not those guys exist, whether every time he walks down the street and he sees these men in suits, uh, whether or not they actually exist or if they are, um, again, another figment of uh, Elliot's paranoid um, imaginations. I see. I think overall this episode is pretty good. It's pretty engaging. I like the fact that there is dual uh, hacker groups, the Dark Army and F Society, both wish to have the end goal of destroying Evil Corp, but going about it in different manners. Both pretty evil if you think about the fact that Mr. Robot, uh, real or not, wants to blow up a natural gas plant in order to take out a mountain and doesn't really care whether or not how many people may die as a result of the explosion. The other tidbit, um, prior to Mr. Robot uh, tossing Elliot off the pier was that Elliot the reason why he was meeting Mr. Robot was because Elliot saw a solution which is something that hackers do they they see a problem they seek a solution he saw a solution of taking down Steel Mountain without uh, killing anyone which just seems something that Mr. Robot wasn't really interested in doing uh, because he doesn't believe Elliot is fully committed to the cause and which is one of the reasons why he tossed Elliot off the pier in that in that end of the episode but it's interesting seen in it of itself uh another aspect of this is um the whole christian slater uh, mr robot personality his uh fearer and his positions that he has against the corporations and against capitalism and against the way the entire system is built uh it has underpinnings into the uh, cypherpunk movement. It seems to be, again, like an agglomeration of a couple different uh, personalities that are part of the early wave of the Internet. Uh, we'll talk about that the next episode, because, again, um, I think I need to see a little bit more for me to confirm um, the basis upon which I think uh, Mr. Robot is based off of. But that's it for this episode. It, again, it's very intriguing, uh, very uh, up the snuff when it comes to the use of technology within the episodes, even the, the little things like the Groupon coupon and stuff like that. Um, it seems to be very consistent in its consistency of portraying the hacker culture, but also the methods that the hackers use uh, on the episode. I find it very fascinating when I finally learned that, you know, put an SD card in a microwave, you're not a, not going to blow up the microwave, but that is a type of method that you could use to destroy information. And uh, that is something that people actually do in real life. I knew the drill bit thing, but I wasn't um, familiar with the, uh, the use of the microwave. Uh, so it has become like a kind of a how to, uh, manual in a sense that's seen for anyone who wants to know how to destroy information if they need to. Oh, but again, that's it for this episode. This has been a Hiroshima Space Odyssey Network production.